From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Nam, the show connecting your neighborhood with the world. Washington's underground music scene has always blended art and social justice. Since the 1980s, local punk bands became global music icons with an ethos that the personal is political. But Sean Gray says this local music scene that prides itself on inclusion often has blinders to people with disabilities. As someone who uses a walker to get around, he faces a host of practical and cultural obstacles when he goes out to a show. Many local venues make it difficult or impossible for him to watch performances by staging them in narrow spaces and basements. But Gray also sees a deeper challenge that gets to what it means to be an art scene that is truly inclusive. He joins us in studio. Sean Gray runs two local record labels, Fan Death Records and Accidental Guest. He's the creator of a website called Is This Venue Accessible? which keeps track of accessibility of music venues around the country. He's also a member of the local band Birth Defect. Sean Gray, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You recently wrote a very compelling essay on Pitchfork, the music website, about going to shows when you have a disability, you began with the line, when I go out, I hope no one notices. Give us a sense of some of the challenges you face when you go out to a show. You know, I think that line started because it was when I was writing the piece, I was I was actually thinking to myself, I wanted to do a piece where it was just like, what was it like to go to a show? So when I started that line, the idea was I I just want to go to this show. And whenever, eight times out of ten, whenever I go to a show, whether that be at a bigger venue like the 930 Club or at a smaller venue like the Velvet Lounge or something, let's say those are local um, clubs here in the area, um, I always get like one person that comes up to me and says, oh, I'm so glad you could make it out, like, or like just stares at me while I'm like, you know, trying to get up, you know, a Mount Fuji-esque, you know, (laughs) amount of stairs. So uh, it's one of those things where I'm like, in my mind, I I just want to get to the show. I just want to see this band play. I want to hang out with my friends. And uh, I I don't want people to notice, you know. And so it was one of those things where I, I wanted that to be clear. But ultimately, as the piece goes on, I kind of want people to notice because this is an issue, you know. So the idea of that piece was to just give somebody a general overview of what it was like for somebody like me to go to a show. Now, I have mild cerebral palsy, and like you said, I, I use a walker to walk. And, and the first thing I want to make clear is disability is a spectrum. You know, just because I use the walker, uh, that doesn't mean what's uh, accessible for me will be accessible for somebody who uses a wheelchair or uses another type of mobility device. So I want to make that clear from the get-go, is that just because I I have this particular disability or I use this mobility device, that whatever works for me is going to work for everybody else who has a disability. That's that's not the case. But I, I wanted to give a general overview of what it was like to go to a show for me. Well, you did point out that disability exists along a spectrum and that a lot of people can, so to speak, pass. They do not have an outward manifestation of their disability. You use the language of coming out to talk about going public with the fact that you have a disability. How difficult is it for a young person to talk about such personal experiences? Yeah, I, when I was younger, the, when I would go to shows and when I would just do things, normal things, um, I didn't think of my disability. Uh, it wasn't until I was in my mid-20s when I was finishing up my undergrad studies uh, that I really started to realize that disability uh, disability is an oppression and accessibility issues do exist. I used to kind of feel like my disability was just something that I had to not necessarily get over, but just deal with. And I never really questioned, you know, the accessibility of a venue or why can't I go to this show or why can't I go to that, even that store, you know. So it wasn't until, again, I was in my mid-20s where I was like, I have a disability and this this is really affecting me and it's I, I'm limited to to the experiences I can have in in life and so you know punk and music and was was an outlet to kind of well I, I couldn't really play outside as a kid um, so I stayed in and listened to my dad's records and so it was one of those things where I felt like oh well there's no physical activity here I can just 
do this thing and be a part of this. And when I discovered punk, when I was like, you know, 13, 14, uh, I felt like I could be a part of this and really like change things. But never once was my disability really brought up. It was, it, there were other social issues, you know? So I never once really thought about my, my disability until I was in my mid twenties. And, and coming out that way was, it, it wasn't difficult, but it was, it was a realization I had to deal with. Let's be clear here. You discovered punk just before you discovered the show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, it was one of those things where I, I grew up in the, the suburbs of Baltimore, actually, Ellicott City. Um, and there wasn't a lot of shows going, going on in Ellicott City. So I would just sit and listen to records, you know. And, but I knew at some point I'd be able to go to a show. And I started going to shows when I was around like 14 um, in D.C. That's when I started Is that going. how you got involved with the underground music scene? And how did that scene impact you? As a teenager, I think as a as a teenager, the it, you know every time you hear somebody talk about punk, the the same thing you get the same answer over and over again, which is you feel like you can do anything. You feel like you're part of a community, and and it, and it did. I started my own record label when I was 18, right when I got out of college, or when I I'm sorry, when I got out of high school. And I, I, if I didn't have punk, I, I don't think I would have been able to do that because I didn't know that until I discovered punk that a kid in there bedroom can put out a record like that just seemed unreal to me up until I discovered that you could do that and then when I saw the discords when I saw the touch and goes do that when I saw the kill rock star labels do that and the the idea that they did that themselves I I of course gravitated towards that I thought that was the greatest thing so punk really gave me this this kind of foundation that uh hey I could do anything and the art can kind of be anything as long as it makes me feel good and B, they were talking about social issues that I I never even thought of before. And granted, again, I was only 14, 15, but they were talking about feminist issues, LGBTQ issues, race issues that, you know, before that I was listening to like just regular MTV rock and they weren't talking about those things. So that I gravitated towards that pretty instantly. In case you're just joining us, we're talking with Sean Gray. He runs two record labels, Fan Death Records, an accidental guest creator of a website that's called Is This Venue Accessible? He's also a member of the local band Birth Defects. If you'd like to join the conversation, give us a call, 800-433-8850. How would you assess the representation of people with disabilities in the arts? Sean Gray has talked about coming out as a person with a disability and talking publicly about the challenges you face and your own identity. Have you had a similar experience? If you're living with a disability, how has the way you talk about it and think about it changed over the years? 800-433-8850. You can send email to kojo at wamu.org. Join the conversation at our website, kojoshow.org. And if you'd like to learn more about this issue and more about our local art scene, you can check out WMU's Bandwidth blog at bandwidth.fm. There you'll find a deep dive on this topic, including a look at how music venues respond to these concerns. Concerns, and you'll also find a whole lot of content about the bands that make up our local scene. Again, that is bandwidth.fm. Um, within the music scenes that you've come through, Sean, live shows play a critical part in community building. You say, when I want to go to these shows, I not only want to see the band, I also want to hang out with my friends. Many bands consider the feedback that they get from the crowd to be a part of the art they're creating, and many fans feel like they're a part of the art. Is that why it matters that people with disabilities should be able to attend shows? Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, coming from D.C. and, and you know, anybody that's into punk and, and knows about the, the history of punk in D.C., it, inclusion is almost number one. It is number one in D.C. That's kind of like when I think of D.C. punk and hardcore, I think of positive force. I think of those shows that I went to when I was 13 or 14 that were benefit shows for the homeless or LGBTQ issues, things like that. But when I was growing up and going to those shows and I went to dozens of those shows that were benefits, there was never once one band or one benefit about any accessibility issues. So again, I grew up thinking that my disability wasn't an oppression, nor did it matter, because nobody was speaking about it. Nobody was talking about it. So I, you know, to my friends, whenever we would speak of social issues, that just wouldn't, it just wouldn't come up. You know what I mean? So, uh, but again, the idea of uh, it being a community, that's, that's what you want and what you hope for and what you, so when you're going to a show, that's like the ultimate social experience in punk. You know what I mean? That is where 
that is punk to go to a show and see your friend's band play maybe in front of 20 people maybe in front of 200 people maybe at the 930 club maybe a backstage black hat but it's one of those things where when i'm going to those shows you know uh there are certain venues in the area where i have to actually game out whether i want to like have a drink at the bar because the the actual bathroom is up a set of stairs. A lot of this story for you is a question of how you tackle stairs. I don't right. want to belabor that, but you point out that you're put in a really impossible position at these shows. Yeah, I you know, it's one of those things where let's say the bathroom is upstairs and my friends are at the bar all having a drink. And yeah, I can hang out with them, but there's a certain social aspect that I kind of lose because I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm not a part of that. And mm -hmm. that's not saying that you should or shouldn't drink. It's just that's part of it. And I don't even have that option sometimes. I'm just, it, if the bathroom is impossible to get to or, or inaccessible, I, I don't have a choice. Um, so you lose that social aspect. And when you start shaving off social aspects of those shows and, and social aspects of that art community, you, you lose what it actually is about. And so I end up feeling excluded you know there's a lot of bands in dc right now that talk about inclusion and this isn't me you know dissing them in any way but th i never hear any of them speak about accessibility i've never once heard a band on stage you know say you know by the way you know this venue had you know two dozen stairs and this isn't right that's never happened 800-433-8850. What kinds of steps do you think art institutions should be taking to become more inclusive? 800-433-8850. You can also shoot us a tweet at Kojo Show. You just brought up the bigger question of representation in the arts here. Many of the venues and the artists we're talking about can plausibly claim that they don't see a lot of people with disabilities at their shows or showing up at a DIY space, so they might think there is no demand for access. That's why you don't hear it announced at shows. And and that's the thing. There 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 is. You know what I mean? If 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 it was brought if it was if I could go on a website and see what the accessibility is of that venue and I knew it, I, I would go. Sometimes I would go to these shows like just not knowing what the accessibility is and f have to turn around because it's just a set of stairs. So if I'm going to a show alone and I'm not going with a friend or anything like that, I ha and and I don't know anything about that venue, I'm taking a risk of not being able to get into that venue. And, and people have asked me, well, why don't you just ask for help? Well, it's not that easy to just ask for help. I'm very vocal about my disability and I've quote unquote come out with it, but there are a lot of people that have disabilities that don't feel comfortable asking for help and that, that aren't sure or just don't want to do that. So that's tough and it's, you can't expect just because I'm vocal about it, the next person with a disability to be vocal about it as well. Um, but I think the other thing is too, it's, it's not just stairs, you know, it's, it's bathroom accessibility. The one, I keep bringing that up, but it's something as small as that. It's being able to actually see the band on the stage. You know, um, the 930 club, they don't have an elevator to their upstairs area and you're kind of stuck if you can't get up those stairs. And I'll, when I go to the 930 club at this point, it's only to see bands that are like big, that'll you know, that can pack in 1,500 people. And if I'm not right up front, like I saw Sleater Kinney a couple of weeks ago, and if I wasn't right up front, uh, I it would have been miserable. It would have been a miserable show for me because I would have just had to, like, stare at somebody's back. You know, I didn't have the option to go upstairs to that balcony, which I would have gone to if I could. Well, there are people who will say, but I'm sure that there are people at these shows who offer to help you up the stairs, but that's not an option you can calculate on before you go to a show. That, that's not an option, and it's also, there's, you know, it's one of those things where I don't, not everybody would feel comfortable with that. Somebody that you don't know offering you help, that's, that's great, but other people may not feel comfortable with that. Um, I, whenever I go to a 930 club show, this is more often than not at the end of the show, somebody drunk will like see the walker and get in front of me and start going, Hey everybody, we got a disabled person. Everybody get out of the way. And this person is pushing people out of the way. And it's, it, it's, it's terrible. It feels, it, it's really pointing me out and putting me as the other, you know, and people tend to think, Oh, well that I'm just helping this person. But Ultimately, you're really not. You're, you know, you're underscoring my disability. I'm glad you mentioned the other because we got a tweet from Tori. He says, does Sean have an idea why disability accessible 
accessibility isn't widely supported like other forms of social oppression, race and gender? I think I, I actually think and the theory I have is because of the ADA. I think the ADA is great and I'm glad that it exists. But because it exists, there is this kind of idea that, well, there are things in place. There are laws in place that are going to take care of people with disabilities. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. And I think it's easy for people to push this aside because the representation of disability right now is either you're a really young kid with a disability and you're kind of like used as inspirational porn or you're a really old person that, you know, a political party can use as kind of like senior citizens with disabilities. That's, but there's no like in between. There's no teens with disabilities or no people with disabilities in the arts. You know, there's... There's no, like, to me, and I know they exist, but there's no huge representation of people with disability in art, in music. I don't know anybody else that's in a band that that has a disability. Inspirational porn. So when one goes to, say, a sporting event and someone with a disability is brought out who performs the national anthem, is that what you mean by inspirational porn, a kid who's brought out to sing the national anthem? You know, I, th I think that really depends, but I think there's this idea of, if you're on Facebook or something and you see these inspirational stories of like, there's this child with a walker that's just learning to walk, or, you know, there's this uh, person in a wheelchair who's going to prom, you know, like, it, the people that are posting about those and that are sharing those are, are more than likely able-bodied people that are really kind of like reassuring themselves that they're good people and that like, you know, the world isn't a terrible place and I'm not a terrible person, you know. Uh, I, I really, I am all for representation of disability in, in any kind of media. But I think when there's, when there's traffic to be driven and, 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 and blog posts to like for advertisers to make money off of and things like that, I think that's when it becomes inspirational porn and we aren't really viewing it as though like, yeah, like, oh, there's an issue here. It's just like, wow, the world kind of stinks, but this is happening right now, you know, so. I got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Sean Gray. If you have calls, stay on the line. We will get to your calls if you'd like to. The number is 800-433-8850. If you'd like to learn more about this issue and about our local ad art scene, check out WMU's Bandwidth blog at bandwidth.fm. I'm Kojo Nam. Welcome back. We're discussing the local music scene and disability rights with Sean Gray, who runs two local record labels, Fan Death Records and Accidental Guest. Sean is also the creator of a website called Is This Venue Accessible, which keeps track of accessibility of music venues around the country. He's also a member of the local band Birth Defects. With relationship with relation to accessibility, we got a tweet from Emily Sean. Do music venues include accessibility information on their websites? How are local venues accommodating physical disability? Well, that's that that kind of you know draws me into what the actual site is about. Um, it, it's one of those. Is this venue accessible? Uh, yeah, it's uh, one of those things where that actually that site was born to really kind of quickly go through how that site was born. I was laid off from my day job back in November, and um, it was a bummer. And I didn't leave my home for a couple of days. Um, but at the end of the week, there was a hardcore band called Red Death. They were playing. Uh, I didn't know where they were playing. I knew they were playing that day on a Friday. And I was like, well, I kind of want to get out of the, my apartment. I want to grieve. You know, I want to, like, have a beer and, and see one of my favorite DC hardcore bands right now. So I went and I looked up and saw where they were playing. And they were playing at this venue called The Pinch, which is there's a flight downstairs to get to the actual show space. I got really angry, and at first I was kind of like, I can't even grieve losing my job like a normal person, <laughs> you know, um, and see like one of my favorite bands. Um, so I ended up uh, at first getting angry and thinking, oh, well, I could just call out the venue online. And But then I was like, I thought about it more and more, and I thought about all the shows that I went to, and I was like, it's because people don't have information, you know? And so nowhere on the Pinch's site is there any accessibility information. Um, so I decided, I'm, I was like, I'm just going to map out all of the DC venues that I know and their accessibility information and just put it on a blog and that'll be that. And as I was mapping it out and kind of really putting the data together, um, 
I got really bummed because I realized how many venues were inaccessible. I would go on their sites and I would wouldn't see any accessibility information. I, they may even be accessible, but I don't know. You know, whenever I I used to use Yelp as a kind of a way to like gauge if a place was inaccessible or accessible. And if there was no any information, whether that be accessible or inaccessible, I would just have to default to that the venue was inaccessible and just not go. So the idea was, well, I don't ever want to have to deal with this again and like have to like look up on their websites like is this venue accessible? So I just started that. And then, you know, I'd been doing music and touring for the last 14 years, you know, and I I knew a lot of people and I've gone to a lot of other venues outside of DC and Baltimore. And I was like, well, I can just start doing New York venues. I used to go to New York a lot. So I'll just start doing New York venues. And it just, and then I got my friends involved. And I, and I realized that if I make this a community project, that's what punk really is. This, you know, like the idea to get people involved, to get a social awareness that this is an issue and to really make people feel like they have a stake in this. Um, the idea kind of sprung from that and it went from being on like a Tumblr site to now it's uh, on an actual like dot com. I'm using a WordPress backbone. I made sure that it's ex- the, the site is accessible for screen readers. There's no frills on that site. There's a, a trend right now in the disability community to have these sites that like rank what's accessible and not. And that's great and awesome. Um, but there's a lot of like graphic content and there's like ratings of like stars. The one thing that I thought a lot of them were missing was just information, you know? Huh? And so one of the things about is this venue accessible is it's information driven. It's very detailed, or I try to get as much detail as I, I possibly can. So everything from there are seven stairs to there's a railing on the right side. The bathroom is over on the left side, but it's inaccessible. You know, like it's extremely detailed. Like, I want to start doing capacity because, you know, there are people with anxiety that if they go to a smaller shows, that that could be uh, an issue. Hold up for a second, because a lot of people would like to join the conversation. Here's Bob in Chillum, Maryland. Bob, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, folks. Um, Sean, I'm curious. Uh, you've been to a lot of spaces, and you know, especially with more... DIY uh, small spaces and house spaces. Um, I'm curious what you're proposing. Um, everything can't be modified with an elevator. And <clears throat> along those lines, I feel that you're sort of potentially misusing the word oppression. Um, I think that the world is full of lots of situations. And if you encounter a space that hasn't been modified to fit the demands of your individual body, <clears throat> that doesn't necessarily equal oppression. Uh, I think you are speaking in somewhat overblown terms. Um, also, I grew up in D.C. I've been going to punk shows in D.C. since the early 80s. And back in the day, <clears throat> very likely that your friends would have just taken you downstairs and... <clears throat> I don't really see. I think this is a little over dramatic. Anyway, well, allow, allow me to have him respond because I, I, a lot yeah. of the larger arts venues in the region are compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. But I guess the point that Bob is making is that underground music thrives on a smaller scale and grassroots venues, DIY spots. And I guess it could seem unrealistic to ask someone who's hosting a house show to sure, build, to build sure. a ramp. This is, I'm glad he called and I wanted this to happen so bad. Um, that's a pure representation of like what I'm battling against. Because there's, this isn't over dramatic. When I'm ex- punk is about in- inclusion, right? The idea of including everyone. When you are in a band, let's say Fugazi. Let's say Fugazi. When you're in a band like Fugazi and you talk about every single kind of oppression or social issue, yet you never once mention accessibility. When you play shows that. You claim to be, oh, we want everybody to come in where I can't come in. You're, in, you're excluding me. You're oppressing me from being a part of this movement, this art. Because isn't that what punk is all about? Isn't that what like, art is supposed to be all about? It's supposed to be about inclusion? I, I don't think I, I'm being overdramatic by using the term oppression. People aren't even thinking about this. There have been many times where... I've been excluded because I have a disability. People not knowing how to confront me, just completely 
assuming that I shouldn't be a part of something. And to me, that's totally oppression. Uh, the idea that getting my friends to ask to carry me, that's, I'm sorry, but you know, like that's, now look, I think the what he's getting at is, well, what do you propose as an answer? Indeed, we got a tweet from Demon Buster, who says, what can an able-bodied punk musician and fan do to make the punk scene more inclusive for disabled people? Sure, I, here's the thing, I don't expect DIY venues to change. I don't expect a black cat to change. I don't expect a 930 club to change. I don't expect the Velvet Lounge to change. What I, what I do expect, though, is bands become aware of this. Now, let's, here's an example. Let's say DC9, right? That's an inaccessible venue. Let's say a mid-range pitchfork band like, I don't know, Merchandise or like Speedy Ortiz from last year plays 930 Club. But then they realize that it's inaccessible. And then they start telling DC9, like, we don't want to play your venue. Let's say a band like that does that. And then another band of that stature does that. Then what is DC9 going to do? They're going to lose money. So that's when they'll start paying attention. They're not going to pay attention to my rinky-dinky website. But what they will pay attention to is when those bands look on my site and then they see like, oh, this is an inaccessible venue and then decide not to play it. There's a certain band that, unfortunately, I don't think we can name their name on the air, but Perfect P, we'll just name them as that. I'm Meredith, their singer, uh, I'm really good friends with, and she's very aware of these issues, and she, uh, they were playing DC9 uh, last year, and she had texted me and she said, oh, Sean, are you gonna show up? And I was like, I can't, I, I, it's inaccessible. Like, I'll hang out with you at the bar, but I can't see your show. Um, and then she was like, oh, wow, and immediately texted her booking agent and said, we never want to play this venue again. And any time that there, if we can get accessibility information, I want it. And she stuck to that. Allow me to go back to the telephones because Peter in Rockville, Maryland is on. Peter, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I, uh, Sean, we have actually met down at the H Street um, uh, United CP uh, Events. Uh, mm. My son, uh, my son Pete, uh, used right. the wheelchair, right. and he's a ra he's a rapper. Actually, you may recall. Yeah, you yeah. You yeah. mentioned that there aren't that you, you don't see a lot of people in the arts, but Pete is actually uh, he is a rapper. It's uh, sort of unusual. He's uh, he's uh, a white rapper, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, my point is that um, besides the you know his talented rapping, um, we have experienced uh, what you've experienced uh 930 club um called a day in advance uh they're very um open to helping to make sure there's space allotted um unfortunately it's right in front of the uh the speakers and um oh i went to see the band with my son about two years ago and my ears are still ringing so uh <laughs> but that one solution might be uh some sort of platforming you know, and I don't right. know how you how you do this, but if you could, you know, have a ramped platform that's not in front of the speakers, um, that would be advantageous. You know, that'd right. be good. Okay. Yeah, and I think so, that I think the the idea with the the platform is great. I think what is unfortunate though is I think some venues might look at that as though if they build this platform, if it's something that like stays there, they might lose money because a platform will take up more space than than you know, like just able-bodied people would take because you need that extra space for mobility devices and things like that. And they're going to lose money because they're going to lose patrons paying for alcohol or ticket sales. Um, and I'm not saying that 930 Club isn't willing to do that. I'm just, I, I have a feeling that some of those venues may not make those changes because there's money to be lost. Again, I, I don't expect DIY venues nor a 930 Club to change. I'm not saying that they, I would love them to change and they should they, if they can, yeah, they should. But uh, I, I'm not expecting that from this project. What I am expecting is dialogue. And again, people realizing that this is an issue. And if you're in a band that is really about inclusion and really about understanding social issues, we can't just sweep this under the rug because it's not a sexy topic or something. You know? Peter, thank you for your call. We move on to Marilyn in Washington, D.C. Marilyn, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, <clears throat> as I told the person who screened my call, I am a person who has been dis disabled since birth in that I am blind. I am now 77 years old, so I've lived 
my life uh, <clears throat> dealing with uh, accessibility issues uh, and advocacy. Uh, one of the problems with the Americans with Disabilities Act is that this is new construction that has all these standards. These venues that you're talking about, for the most part, I can imagine, are not new construction. Uh, I think you are right that people think, well, because do we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, it's taken care of everything. It certainly has not. Uh, the organization that I think, now I'm a life, I'm a, a very long term member of the American Council of the Blind, and we have supported um, accessibility for all disabilities for a long time. In fact, we were probably one of the key organizations in getting the Americans with Disabilities Act passed. Uh, but what I would suggest to you is the possibility of contacting the American Association of People with Disabilities, uh, which is a, a broad-based disability uh, advocacy organization, and see whether they can give you any suggestions. Okay. Thank you very much for your call and for your suggestion, Marilyn. Sean, this year marked the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act, and since then, many of the victories that the disability advocacy community of which people like Marilyn are members has won have come about through a compliance approach, setting standards from the top down, compelling organizations, businesses to comply with them. But when we think about this issue from the bottom up, the key seems to be to move beyond compliance to thinking proactively about these issues. How do we do that? I mean, I think, again, sites like mine, not to pat myself on the back, but I think... And I should mention that the website is called itvaccessible.com. Right, yeah. And uh, I, I think it, it takes sites like mine to really put this in the forefront of people. And I also think we have to change how we, we think about disability and how it actually, again, the representation of disability right now is either you're a really, really young child... Uh, used, again, as inspirational porn, or you're an older person, and there's no in-between. There's no representation of what happens when you're a teenager. When when you have a disability, it's like you're not allowed to... There's certain things that you're not allowed to have, like whether that be, you know, romantic feelings or sexual feelings. You're like, that. that's not part of, like, having a disability. You, those are stripped away from you. You know, it's those. there's no even representations of that. And when there's no representations of that in popular culture, the, then people with disabilities become less than human. And they become something else. They become the other because they don't have those, you know, those privileges of... Again, romantic feelings, sexuality, or going to, in art, you know, like there again, there's and I'm stoked that there there are certain people with disabilities in art, but they aren't focused on like able bodied people are they just aren't, you know, and, and those things need to change. And so for us to really start a, a, a really good discussion and dialogue about this, we need to start thinking of people with disabilities as human. And I know most people listening to this are like, well, I think of people with disabilities as human. But again, I, I, I really, really believe that there's certain things that people with disabilities just aren't, quote unquote, allowed to have. And when those things are stripped away, like I said, you become less than human. And it's very easy. It's very easy to, like, treat people with disabilities like, oh, like pat on the head. Like, you know, I, one story really quickly I could say is I remember my last final in college and I was getting breakfast at McDonald's. I went to University of Maryland and I was in the food court. And I was holding on to my breakfast and just walking to a table. And this, uh, you know, lady comes up to me and goes, I just want to say, I can't, it's so great that you're actually out and about. And I can't believe it, you know, you, the, wow. And I'm just like, look, lady, I'm just trying to eat my breakfast. <laughs> like, I just want to eat, you know, I want to eat my egg McMuffin and my hash brown because it's hot. Like, let me, let I don't do want to be condescended to right now. Right, exactly. And there's that idea that, and those people come up to me all the time as, as if it's easy so like it's it's nothing, you know. It's and I equate it to like but, that's when you say to to somebody who's a person of color like you speak so well, like, you know. It's like that is what it's kind of like, you know. We're out of time, but we got an email from Mike in Baltimore who said the majority of disabled people have an invisible disability. It can be yeah. very frustrating, 
as you look normal, but might have any number of diseases, conditions, genetic disorders, PTD, PTSD, etc. The list is indeed yeah, and I'd, very I'd, long. Just quickly, when it, like invisible disability is important, we also need to keep that in mind. Just because I have a mobility device, that's, you know... Sean Gray, he runs two record labels, Fan Death Records and Accidental Guest, creator of the website itvaccessible.com. Dot com is this venue accessible? He's also a member of the local band Birth Defects. If you'd like to learn more about this issue, more about our local art scene, check out WMU's Bandwidth blog at bandwidth.fm. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate Going to take a short break. When we come back, shock and awe, the unusual sequence of events that led to the resignation of Illinois Congressman Aaron Shock. I'm Kojo Namdi. The events leading to this week's surprise announcement that Illinois Congressman Aaron Schock would resign read like the plot of a TV show, from stories about his lush Downton Abbey-esque office decor to widely Instagrammed photos of his travels on donors' private planes and questions about his vehicle expenses. Schock's behavior in office led to a wave of legal and ethical questions for the promising young GOP star. Here to help us unpack the potential reverberations within Congress and among politicals more broadly is Hannah Hess. Hannah Hess is a staff writer for Roll Call. She joins us from the Senate Press Gallery. Hannah Hess, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Hannah, first, for those who perhaps had not heard of him before the flurry of coverage leading up to this resignation, who is Aaron Schock? Uh, Aaron Schock, as a matter of fact, happens to represent where my parents live in rural Illinois. Um, his district covers Peoria, Illinois, in the center of the state's uh, blue, blue-collar, solidly Republican um, district. He was elected to Congress. Um, <clears throat> he, this is his, he was starting his fourth term in Congress. He was the first person ever to be elected to Congress who was born in the ni- 1980s. Um, he's had a pretty solid track record as a lawmaker, was considered, widely considered a rising star and a nice guy. Um, plenty of people were sad to hear the news of his resignation just on a personal level from working with him. Um, and uh, he was, he's um, leaves Congress at 34. I think he's also the youngest person ever to resign from Congress. So your parents are about to lose a congressman. Some have said that the congressman was a lot of flash, less substance. He drafted zero bills, none that became law since his 2008 election to Congress. But is that unusual? And what sense do you have for how effective he was? Um, it, it's true that um, on, the, on the legislative front, you could definitely make the argument that, yeah, that he wasn't a big player when it comes to writing legislation. Um, I think that the people who were complimentary of him, I heard from both Democrats and Republicans that he was uh, genuinely opening to listening to both sides of the aisle. He worked a lot, a lot with um, the, these younger members of Congress who are trying to, uh, to bring more bipartisanship, talk about working across the aisle and um, he was genuinely seen in that capacity as somebody who who was willing to work for both sides. He was also a huge fundraiser, so um, re- Republicans are definitely going to miss him in that from that aspect. If you'd like to join the conversation, call us at 800-433-8850. We're talking about the resignation of Republican Congressman from Illinois, Aaron Schock, and we're talking with Hannah Hess, staff writer for Roll Call. Have you been following the story of Aaron Schock's downfall? Give us a call. Um, what do you think Aaron Schock's story tells us about our broader political culture? 800-433-8850. You can send email to kojo at wamu.org or shoot us a tweet at Kojo Show. Hannah, the series of events leading to his resignation started almost as a late-night punchline when Ben Terrace of the Washington Post wrote about the congressman's office decor's resemblance to a Downton Abbey set. What chain of events as a fellow reporter strikes you about the way in which this story leading to his resignation has unfolded? It was incredibly rapid. um, And there were just, you know, over the course of six weeks, we've seen report after report um, coming from both reporters back home in Chicago looking into his finances, a lot of things written within the Beltway from different media publications, Um, just basically a closer scrutiny of the public disclosure records that uh, that members file uh, 
explaining how they're they're spending the million or so dollars that they're allocated to run their office. You know, a lot of times those things are reported rather innocuous, innocuously. Um, he, Aaron Schock reported a travel expenditure of over $10,000 that was a, a trip for him and his staffers to New York um, for a, a global concert series. There doesn't appear to be, have been any official work done by the staffers that were invited along for that trip that, you know, taxpayers paid to send on this, this trip with the congressman. Um, and it, it really proves, I think, the value of um, of reporters continuing to dig into this information and, and uh, do the legwork of, of, you know, sifting through thousands of pages of documents and uh, and holding people accountable by just asking questions about what, how the money has been spent. Um, also, uh, it was interesting that when Shock was confronted in his district back in Illinois, uh, after weeks and weeks, I think it was about five weeks into this, uh, since the Washington Post, uh, that wonderful, colorful article about his office came out, uh, Aaron Shock said, I, I don't know if I'm breaking the rules. I don't know if I'm breaking the law. I hope not. Um, which is, and he also suggested that this is common among Congress, and that if it, if um, you know reporters looked more closely, we could probably find a lot of other people who are abusing the travel privileges as he is alleged to have done. How surprised are his colleagues uh, that he resigned? As far as you know, many thought, I guess, that he shouldn't. Uh, it, it came as a surprise to the Speaker of the House himself. Um, uh, a lot of times, you know, especially a member of the Republican Party would give some notice to the, the leadership of their party when they're going to um, go ahead and step down. And Aaron Schock didn't do this. It was um, it seems to be a, a quick decision. And people were still reeling from it um, on Tuesday afternoon, immediately after the news broke. The Office of Congressional Ethics was reportedly investigating Shock for his use of taxpayer and campaign money in the wake of this information. Can you give us a sense, Hannah, of what specific rules and policies govern how members use their budgets and where Shock likely ran afoul of those? Well, there's actually a lot of leeway on how members can spend those those budgets. Like I said, it's about $1.2 million on average that each, each office is all, allocated. And um, they're basically allowed to run almost like an independent entity. You know, you, you say you file your expenses, but you can spend your money. As a, a member of Congress uh, who was a former legislative staffer described it to me, you are accountable to the 700,000 or so people that elected you and expected to use those funds however you see fit to represent them. The one thing you can't do is lie about how you're using the funds, which it appears that, uh, that Aaron Schock did do. Um, he filed double the for double the amount of travel reimbursement that his vehicle appears to have traveled um, and then he also uh, paid for some private plane rides perhaps in violation of ethics rules because you have to get um, a previous these rules have changed but back when it's actually become more lax now, which is reassuring. <laughs> um, but back when he violated the rules, you had to have a waiver from the House Ethics Committee when you wanted to take a, a private plane ride. Um, the idea being that someone who owns a private jet probably has a lot of money, might have uh, you know specific interests that they want to see that they're interested in advancing through Congress. And so to be flying a member around his or her district for a while and uh, getting to tug their ear about whatever your, your interest is, is a big privilege. So the House Ethics Committee should be signing off on that and at least having some clearance. Um, the other uh, the other element of this is his, his campaign funds, spending campaign funds, you know, strictly on, on uh, personal expenses. Um, it, and and um, getting perks as well because he uh, he sold his house for what um, appears to be above market value to someone who had been a political donor. So uh, kind of like what we saw with Governor McDonald down in Virginia, are you getting special perks just because of your role as an elected official? Well, I saw where a number of members said, you know, the rules don't need to be clarified. How black and white are these rules? Is there any sense that they're open to interpretation among from other members that you've spoken with? <laughs> yeah, um, actually, one of the favorite quotes that I heard was uh, from a member of the House Administration Committee who said, you know when you're fudging. <laughs> and <laughs> he, um, so basically, you can interpret these however you, however you want to. If you think that it serves 
um, your constituents, like that New York trip I just referred to, to take to take all your staffers from D.C. and fly them up to New York for a weekend. Or um, uh, if you if you believe that you are acting uh, the way that your constituents are believe represents them, then um, then that's up that's up to you to interpret as a member. Congress has over the past couple of years, really relaxed some of the ways that they divvy up this allowance that they give to members. Mm-hmm. Um, they used to divide it up into different pots and say, you know, this is for staff, this is for mail, um, this is for, you know, furnishing your office. And now it's up to, it, it's almost like we have 435 separate businesses running yeah, up here he on gets, the hill. Yeah, he gets, what, $1.4 million and say, hey, this is to run your office. Exactly. Yeah, this is to hire as many staff as you. You know, there are limits to how many staff that you can hire. But um, it was also reported that he gave his staff some year-end bonuses that have been questioned, and and you know took a, a private photographer on this trip to him with in uh, to tr- trip to India and paid that photographer despite the fact that they weren't a member of his staff. There are particular rules about hiring consultants um, and hiring uh, you know political advisors on your with your official funds but um again it all comes down to the fact that these are really open to the interpretation um of the member him him or herself um shock made headlines when he was first elected well for his youth and one of the tools that reporters of the ap used in digging into his activity was instagram where he posted pictures of his travels on private planes owned by his donors and more is this or does this serve as a reminder for elected officials that there are a growing number of ways to track their behavior and their spending i think that's an excellent point and uh And actually, some members have been starting to say, um, in terms of uh, reporting travel expenses, that they've they know that those are people are having have an eye on those, and they don't want to be accused of over-reporting or misreporting the miles that they've traveled. Aaron Schock uh, it reported double the amount of miles he traveled, um, so they're they simply don't ask for the reimbursement there. And I also think um, there are plenty of of new rules governing use of Twitter, Facebook, other social media, um, and And sometimes members aren't aware of them. Uh, members of the House are the only class within Congress that is not required to undergo annual ethics training. Senators, Senate staff, and House staff all must get an annual refresher of the rules. It's it's only an hour long, but it's something. But uh, members of the House don't have to do this. So I guess it's kind of understandable that they might not know what they're doing when it comes to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or the many other ways that they can step into trouble Um Well, if somebody as young as Shock didn't know, you think a lot of the older members might not know. The one thing I guess they'll want to know is that once you're in the digital environment, now you can be tracked in a wide variety of ways, both in terms of time and place of when photos were taken. Yeah, exactly. Excellent reporting by the AP on that. Indeed it was. Hannah Hess is a staff writer at Roll Call. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And thank you so thank you all so much for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi.